My name is Max. Uh, I'm here from Freebird, which is a small tech startup in the area. I'm here to talk about some of the experiences we've had uh, doing Bayesian inference and doing Bayesian inference at scale. Um, so the goal of the talk is to give some background on Bayesian modeling, because I know like people come here with a wide variety of backgrounds. Not everyone knows everything about everything. Um, so I'll talk a bit about Bayesian modeling, why we might want to use it, why you might want to use it, um, what are some useful inference techniques for iterating faster and scaling to larger data sets. Um, so I'll give a bit of background on Freebird, <coughs> explain why Bayesian inference is useful for us. I'm going to talk about some somewhat relatively new techniques for improving the performance and scaling those, uh, that inference uh, and how we apply them at Freebird. And then I'm going to show some results on some toy data so we can sort of see how well they do at recovering parameters uh, compared to existing methods um, or sort of older methods. And then I'll show some results using data that we use at Freebird. Um, so just can I get a quick show of hands? Like how many people have fit a MCMC model before? Like fit a model using MCMC? Okay, that's about what I expected. Okay, so for those of you who sort of know this stuff already, there's going to be a bit of repetition, so I apologize. But uh, and then hopefully for those of you who are completely new to it, uh, you'll get some uh, new insights. Um, but don't worry if there's like certain parts that you can't follow. I'll try and highlight what the key takeaways are as we go. Cool. So what is Freebird? Uh, so Freebird is a startup here in Cambridge. We help travelers get to their destination. So our main focus right now is in the corporate travel space. Businesses subscribe to Freebird via their like corporate travel agency, uh, and Freebird protects their air travel. So what that means is when a traveler is disrupted, which I'm going to define what that means in a minute, Freebird automatically alerts them and allows them to pick any available flight going from where they are, like a conference, to where they're trying to go, like back home. Uh, so here I'll show an example of what that looks like. So if you have Freebird coverage for your flight, if you're traveling, we will automatically alert you if your flight gets disrupted. You'll get a text message from us that looks like this. You click on that link. It shows you all the options going from where you are to where you're trying to go. Uh, no restrictions or limitations, any airline. Uh, you pick the flight you want, and you're set. You get on that flight, and Freebird pays for that flight. So the role of data science at Freebird is to measure and predict the risk of providing that coverage, uh, both on a flight-by-flight -flight basis and in the aggregate across days, weeks, months, years. Uh, so I mentioned flight disruption. What does that mean? So we cover three types of disruptions, uh, cancellations, misconnections, and severe delays. Um, so today I'm going to talk about misconnections. All right, so what is a misconnection? So you're flying, you know, you have some itinerary that has a stop in the middle that's not where you're trying to go. You're trying to get to your final destination. Uh, so we can think of that as like a binary output. And so your natural reaction to that might be, okay, I'm going to like apply some classification technique to predict misconnections. But if we think about like what exactly is a misconnection, like what is the process determining that, uh, we see we can sort of write that down mathematically, um, or like just in sort of quasi math. <laughs> um, so say you're flying from San Francisco to Denver to Boston to come to Poppies, um, so you have a layover in Denver. So if your arrival flight from or your inbound flight from SFO to Denver is delayed by some amount that exceeds the amount of time you had to make that connection, uh, then you'll miss your connection. But also you have some. If your outbound flight is also delayed, then you can sort of get lucky and make your connection. So it's essentially if, if the arrival delay plus the arrival time exceeds the departure time plus the departure delay. Um, and so looking at this, we see, okay, well, what are the random or like stochastic components of this? So it's these two, right? So the scheduled arrival and scheduled departure don't change. Only the delays are things we need to predict. Um, so we can sort of rearrange that equation and predict, okay, so we're interested in this thing, which is not exactly about predicting a binary thing, it's about predicting two continuous things, which is the arrival and departure delay. And specifically, we're interested in whether that uh, gap is above or below some value, which is essentially the layover time, right? Um, so looking at that, it sort of looks more like a CDF or a like quantile function of some continuous random variable, um, which sort of leads us to, we care about distributions, right? So if you you know, there's a lot of machine learning algorithms and choice of models you could use where you feed it features and it predicts some continuous variable. Great, you get some point estimate prediction. So for instance, in this case, if we had some model that was trained on origin destination as a feature, um, it would give us probably a prediction somewhere around a mean of six minutes because that's sort of the average uh, delay for that flight. Um, but that's not really that useful. It doesn't tell us much about well, how likely is it I don't miss my connection. What we're interested in is the full distribution of delays on that route. So for instance, you know, if you have uh, a delay greater than a half hour, how likely is it that you'll have a delay greater than a half hour, an hour, two hours, etc. Um, and that's sort of what motivates our interest in Bayesian techniques. Um, so just a quick refresher uh, on what uh, Bayesian uh, methods are all about. So we have some 
we're interested in estimating some parameter of theta, and not just a point estimate for the parameter, we're interested in getting the full probability distribution of that parameter theta, given some data we've observed x. And so Bayes, the 18th century minister, came up with this rearrangement using rules of probability to give you this uh, split on the other side, which is your likelihood, so the probability of observing that data given your parameters, and your prior, you place some prior on your parameters, divided by sort of the marginal probability of your, of your data x. Um, and so we're interested not just in those point estimates, but in that full distribution, because that allows us to essentially integrate or average over our uncertainty about how likely different outcomes are to give you a prediction that incorporates sort of the full range of possible outcomes weighted by how likely they are. Um, cool, so just here's sort of the model we'll be thinking about today. Um, it's not really that important, like the specifics of this, it's more just as like an example. Um, but just to make it a little more concrete, we, so we observe some delays, so we have n observations, and then we'll just fit something at the parameter level. So this is sort of a basic hierarchical model. We have a parameter for every origin destination pair, um, and that we sort of parameterize our, uh, our likelihood here for delays is we're gonna use a gumball distribution, which is useful because there's a, a sort of heavy tails, which sort of matches, should hopefully match roughly that distribution that we saw. Um, so yeah, so we fit that. Uh, Cool. So what are some different ways we could fit that model? Um, so one is what's called the maximum a posterior estimate. Um, it's basically just adding regularization. So you're not fitting a full distribution, you're just estimating a point estimate per uh, parameter theta. The advantage of that is it's relatively easy, it's somewhat fast. Um, it should look sort of pretty similar to like standard machine learning stuff. So you have some log, you took the, take the log, and then you can just compute gradients or do you know, newton raphson or whatever your favorite optimization technique is and find a point estimate for every theta, so like that. Um, but again, it doesn't get us that full distribution. So it's, it's useful as a first step, um, and it scales reasonably well, so that's good. Um, but it's not as useful for getting that full distribution. Uh, so in the 1950s and then later in the 70s, um, there were sort of a series of algorithms developed that fall under the category of Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Um, basically, so the problem is that our posterior that we want to estimate from, p of theta given x. We can compute it for given values of theta and x, but it's hard to just have it tell us the full distribution. That's a difficult task. Um, so MCMC, sort of broadly speaking, is a way to get samples from that distribution that allow you to approximate it. Um, but it's a sampler, so you have to run it a bunch of times, and eventually it'll converge to the true uh, posterior, given enough time. Um, so that's sort of the basic idea behind MCMC. I have a video. Uh, so if if we can get it to work, we'll see what that looks like. So here we have, yes, okay. So here we have a distribution that it's trying to sample from, which is sort of given by that blue banana-shaped thing. Um, so at every iteration, it proposes some uh, potential parameter values. Um, so we have two parameters here, the x and the y-axis. So it proposes them from some very easy to sample from distribution, like a standard normal, uh, right? So remember that we can't actually sample from our true distribution here. Um, because it's just computationally infeasible. So instead we sample from like a Gaussian, basic Gaussian, and then accept or reject those samples based on how likely they are, and that likelihood is given, that relative likelihood is given to us by the distribution we're interested in sampling from, which is that blue space. So you see it sort of, I sped it up here. So you see it spends more time in like the high probability areas and tends to reject the low probability areas, but like because it's somewhat random, with some probability it'll eventually get to all those low areas. And so if you give it enough time, it'll eventually converge and your histograms on the x and y axis there will eventually start to look like the true parameter distribution that you're trying to get at. Um, and you can go to this website, you can do it for all kinds of different uh, samples. Cool, so the problem here is that it requires the access to the full data set, and it takes a while because in a high dimensional space or with a lot of data, it takes it a while to compute all those samples um, at every iteration. Um, so we can parallelize by having multiple samplers, so like you can just do many, many chains, but each one needs access to the full data set and is computing the likelihood based on the full data set. Um, so the solution we're gonna talk about here today is something that's sort of uh, been developed over the past sort of decade or so and really sort of ramped up um, via some recent developments, uh, which is variational inference. So we're gonna rephrase our sampling problem as an optimization problem. So thanks to machine learning and deep learning, we have a lot of technologies now that are very good at doing optimization. So if we can just Instead of trying to do sampling, if we can instead phrase this as an optimization problem that gives us a distribution rather than a point estimate, then we can kind of piggyback on all of those tools like TensorFlow and whatnot. Um, so variational inference here, 
so what we do in variational inference is we're going to say, suppose that there is some Q distribution, some like approximate distribution. Uh, we can look at how different is that from the distribution we care about via this KL divergence. We can't directly compute that KL divergence. Instead, we compute a lower bound, maximize that lower bound, um, which is equivalent to sort of roughly optimizing, uh, making those distributions very close. So the KL divergence uh, here is a sort of a measure of like how different the distributions are, basically. Um, so that's sort of the basic idea behind variational inference. There's like a ton of math that goes behind all this like we're not going to get into today, but I'm happy to talk about it later, or I can point you to the relevant papers. Um, the key thing here is like uh, one of the problems with variational inference, as it was originally stated, is it you know works pretty well. Is that halfway? Or, okay, cool. Uh, is it worked pretty well, but it required you to do a bunch of uh, fancy math and algebra, and like I don't have a PhD. Um, you know, I'm a mere uh, industry data scientist, I don't want to, you know, be doing a bunch of derivations uh, every time I change some slight part of my model, right? So additionally, also, I haven't addressed directly the scaling problem, right? Um, so some recent improvements here. Um, so if you don't want to derive new variational update steps every time you do it, there's this uh, uh, paper that came out a few years ago from the team behind Stan, which is a Bayesian inference library, so they're out of Columbia. Um, uh, so sort of Gelman and Kutze Kelber and some other people. Uh, called auto uh, differentiated variational inference. So basically, this does the math for you using like autograd like techniques, um, similar to like you know when you do a fancy neural net, you don't need to compute the exact gradients for all of your various update steps. Um, so that's really nice. And then secondarily, stochastic variational inference, because now we sort of have this more typical optimization problem, we can do essentially equivalent to stochastic gradient descent. So take a little mini batch and do mini batch updates. So we're not computing across the entire data set every time you want to do an iteration. Um, so that allows us to scale. Um, there's also a lot of even more recent development that I'm not going to get into here because I'm not quite as familiar with it, but uh, happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, cool. So some drawbacks here. Uh, because of the way that the approximation is typically done, is often struggles to capture covariance. So there's a lot of like approximation using normal distributions. Um, it's not the same as assuming your model is normal, but by doing the approximation, your Q distribution is often a product of many normal distributions. And so it can struggle to capture that covariance. It can sometimes struggle with tails, which is the thing we're particularly interested in here. Um, you don't get the same convergence guarantees as MCMC. So I think for like many problems, MCMC is guaranteed if you let it run eventually, it'll eventually converge to the correct distribution, whereas variational inference, in many cases, does not have quite as strong guarantees. Um, and so there's still a lot of open questions about what specific problems it works well or doesn't work well on, which I, I sort of feel like is somewhat analogous to like a lot of the deep learning stuff where like we know if you use this exact learning rate and like this exact network structure, you can you know predict images like ImageNet um, very well, but like if you change one thing, it might not work as well, or if you do a slightly different application, it might not work as well. Um, so for the purpose of applying stuff in industry, uh, this sort of motivates uh, our interest in trying to figure out, okay, will this work for our specific problem? Um, and so that's what we get to now. Um, so in our case, can we use variational inference for our problem? Uh, so the code to write this is relatively easy. It just takes a few lines using PyMC3 or other uh, Bayesian inference libraries. Um, but so we want to know, can we use variational inference for our heavy-tailed delay distribution? Um, the way that I went about trying to sort of assess this or get some estimate about this for this talk is Suppose, you know, instead of trying to fit to actual data, we can generate a data set using heavy tail, using the distribution we're interested in, using a range of parameters and like the sort of model we're roughly generally interested in estimating, and then apply variational inference, apply these techniques, and see how well they recover the true parameters. Because since we generate the data, we know what the true parameters are. So here's sort of our experimental setup. So I'm going to create 10 origin airports. These are just like groupings. So like in my hierarchical model, I have like O and D. So I'm just going to create 10 fake ONDs basically. Um, each has their own location and scale parameter. Um, then I'm going to generate observations uh, by randomly selecting origins and then randomly drawing from that origins distribution. Uh, and then I'm going to fit that model using both MCMC and variational inference and then mini batch variational inference, so like the stochastic uh, variational inference, and see how well they do both in terms of accuracy, uh, how well they recover the parameters, as well as how fast they are. Um, okay, so just to sort of walk through 
some results. So here I ran it on like some small uh, small data set um, using MCMC, and we can see just to sort of walk through how to interpret these plots. So on the x-axis is the true, the y-axis is the fitted. So we can see it recovers it basically perfectly. So this is the location parameter. And I do the same for the scale parameter. So again, looks pretty good. Um, and then here, I'm drawing from the likelihood distribution. So you can't quite tell, but there's two histograms there. So it's a pretty good fit because they almost overlap perfectly. So the advantage of the uh, a common thing you do in Bayesian inference is that uh, probability of new data given data you've observed. So integrating over your whole posterior over your parameters. And that's what having the distribution allows you to do. So you can compare that to some held up data set, so some true distribution. Another view of that is this QQ plot, which I quite like because we're interested in the tails. We're often interested in those dots up at the very upper right part of that plot and how close they are to the true line. So this is comparing the quantiles of that distribution, right? So percentile, you know, zero through 100 of the, those distributions. Um, OK, so now to compare uh, our different uh, techniques. So here's the first sort of setup. So we have those 10 groups, origins, generate 10,000 observations. MCMC takes three minutes, so that's pretty good. Um, running variational inference on the whole data set took about one minute. Um, and then, hold on one second. Right, so here's the results for MCMC. So we just saw these, now I'm just grouping them together. So again, looks pretty good. Variational inference also looks good. So this is good news, so it means that we can get those heavy tails using variational inference, in our case at least. Um, and then how well can we do via the stochastic sort of mini batch approximation? There's some slight degradation, but like overall, I think this looks like pretty solid. Um, the time difference here is like pretty minimal, right? So like three minutes versus one minute versus 45 seconds. It's not a huge advantage. So to see sort of, oh, I sort of talked about scaling. So this was for 10,000 observations. Um, what happens is we increase n. So I'm going to go up to a million observations, the same number of parameters, but just way more observations. So I ran this uh, using MCMC, and here's what I got. Um, yeah, so I don't have results to show you for that one. Uh, it just like was not happy. Um, so variational inference, though, recovered pretty well. Uh, it took 35 minutes on my, this is just my local MacBook. Um, it's not even one of the fancy new ones. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, but could we do even better? You know, if we, do, if we take those mini batches, what kind of results do we get? Uh, again, look pretty much the same, but they take one minute. Um, so that's pretty good. Uh, so that essentially is the difference between like, you pick a model, you said to run, you go get coffee, you go play ping pong, like you come back to your desk and it's like, oh, it's like almost done. Then you can check the results and iterate like, oh, we have to tweak something. Whereas run for a minute, you know, you can just set to run and just watch the progress bar go and then like pick your new model uh, based on the results from that. So that's pretty useful. And because we did this experiment where we knew the true values, we can see for sure that it's recovering those. Um, which gives us sort of greater confidence as we iterate on true data sets. Um, so for my final slide, uh, so on actual data, the fit is somewhat less good, potentially because the, the distribution or like the likelihood or the model chosen doesn't fit the real world, which is more complicated uh, quite as well. Um, so I just sort of picked two semi-representative uh, routes. Um, so for Boston to LGA, it looks pretty good. Boston and Denver, not so good. So that's obviously like a bit of a back to the drawing board situation for us. Um, and try and figure out a better model. But the key thing here is that because we can estimate this in a minute instead of an hour, uh, we can iterate on these things much more quickly. Um, so that's all for me. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>